Oh, you found finding your seat. Fabulous. All right. What a question to ask. What a question to ask. Is, is Jesus the one or should we be expecting another? Should we be looking for another hope in order to save a lost and chaotic world? Is there something better than Jesus? Shouldn't we all ask ourselves that at least one time in our life? What are your thoughts, congregation of Christians? It's a funny question to ask a group of people who got out of bed, got dressed, and came to a Christian church, right? I'm like, we're here, dude. You know, hardly anyone comes to church anymore. It's an odd question to ask, but a very important question to ask. Is Jesus the one? Or is Jesus just a prophet? Like our other two sister monotheistic faiths say he is. The one that was established before Jesus was born, I would say Judaism. And the one that established, was established after Jesus' life on earth. And that would be Mohammedism. Both would say, just a prophet. Good guy, but just a prophet. The fascinating part of this passage comes from Jesus' commentary on John. Jesus says, John is more than a prophet. Really? Why is that? What makes John the Baptist more than a prophet? Doesn't he just point to the coming Messiah of the Old Testament? Isn't that what every prophet does? What is so unique about John? What's so different about him? Jesus says, John is the least in the kingdom of God. And everyone born of a woman, every person on this planet who has ever lived is less than he is. Pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? We're all going to hell. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Maybe Jesus is pointing out something in this passage that we're not seeing. Jesus asked the crowd concerning John, Hey, what did you expect to see a man of God to look like? What did you expect to see? What did you think a man of God looked like? Did you think that they would be well-dressed? Did you think he would be a, a popular TV speaker or personality? He uses the credibility of his day, the, the royal courts. That was supposed to be someone who was very important. But we can translate apples to apples. What did you expect to see? A hero, a great public figure. Someone who had 100,000 YouTube views. Not at all. That's not what John was. John was a lightning rod. John told the truth. John pointed out your need for redemption. He pointed to our condition. He prepared us to see the value of the coming Savior. And it was more than saving God's established church. It was about saving the entire world. All different kinds of people with all different backgrounds. Not just the people in the synagogue. So not just a small town prophet at all, but more than a prophet. Is it starting to make sense? He was so humble in his dress, in his presentation, in his words. It was hard to see his greatness when you just looked at him. Jesus said, I assure you, no one born of the flesh is greater than John. 
Yet in heaven, we are all the same. There is no hierarchy. In God's community, there is no supremacy. That's not Christianity. In God's family, everyone is equally valued. Everyone is equal. How is that possible? Because in Christianity, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous on their own, not even one. John brings that doctrine to life to prepare a way for the Lord is to prepare for that truth all are in need of a savior all are in need of redemption so it remains what is so great about Jesus is he the one or should we expect another? Should we expect something better? How does Jesus respond to this? When John's disciples ask him this question, what does he say? He responds in a way that most of us Christians are too shy to respond. He says, to John's disciples, what do you see? What do you see? In other words, answer for yourself. What does the evidence tell you? By your own investigation. That is not how I would answer any of my atheist friends if they were to ask me, what is so great about Christianity? I would never say that. What do you see in the church of Christ? What would they say back to me? Oh, I don't know. Hypocrisy, lack of credible judgment, corruption, a history of violence against non-Christians, or even Christians with different views. And I would have to say, yes. I too see many mistakes that people who called themselves Christians have made. Are you looking for a perfect group of people that have been molded and shaped by a perfect set of guidelines? So what you're saying is, if Christians have never made any mistakes and were perfect in every way, you would finally have found the church that you were looking for. Finally, you would be among your peer group. Is that what you're saying? Oh, not exactly. What is this passage really saying? What really is happening here in this passage? What does Jesus describe? Those who didn't see it before are able to see it now. Those who couldn't hear the truth are now able to hear it and accept it. Those who practiced evil now strive for good. The lepers that no one wanted to hang out with, that had no friends, now have a permanent home and an everlasting family. All because Jesus sacrificed his reputation. He ultimately gave up his life on the cross to include all people into his fellowship. That was his superpower. He did what your culture today is trying to do and is failing miserably. I've never seen more uninclusive and intolerant society that claims to be inclusive and tolerant. It's in this region, America, and it's all over the world. We're a joke. 
the way we treat other people, the way we group up and turn against each other. It's crazy. Where's the camera? It's crazy. You know it. I know it. And we're trying to fix it on our own. Culturally. What started off as a long and prosperous journey through the Protestant Christian ethic for both work and individual freedom has turned into a bunch of warring, small, angry tribes doing everything in their power to destroy one another. It's so weird. It's so weird. You know what we need? We need a bath. That didn't, that didn't hit very well. <laughs> we need a bath. Oh yes, we need a bath. We need to be bathed in the waters of baptism. And those of us who have been baptized, we need to remember our baptism. It's time for a revival. It's time for us to be revived from the dead. We used to have revivals all the time. Every generation had its own revival. But for some reason, we've taken some time off of revival. We're way overdue. But I'm going to tell you, let me warn you about revivals. Revivals do not come out of lukewarm churches. They don't. They don't come out of churches that go through the motions. They come out of churches that go all out for the gospel, that are excited about the gospel, that are excited about sharing the gospel. They come out of churches that want to see the power of God and what it can do in a community. They're looking for it. That spark, that energy. They come out of churches that want to hear how the power of the gospel can transform a person's heart. They come out of churches that wish to embrace the outcast, the spiritually homeless, those who are isolated and alone. Revivals come out of churches who go all out for the gospel. They begin with the shock of inspiration. Revival in church is something that is done by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. It excites us. It ignites us in our faith. When I was young, I heard the word revival. I had no idea what it meant. I remember when I was a little kid and I heard revival, revival. I went to one of those churches that liked to talk about revival a lot. And I used to love this uh, television show. I'll leave you with this. I used to love this television show called Emergency. I don't know if some of y'all from the 70s uh, know about Emergency, uh, Squad 51. Uh, oh my goodness, I used to watch that show all the time. It was my first favorite show. And it was the um, first time I heard the word revival. It wasn't in the Christian sense. It was in the hospital sense. Dr. Brackett would come over this patient and they would be almost dead, right? And then all of a sudden there'd be a flat line. I didn't know what that meant. I was, I was like, what is that? Are they dead? Oh no. And it's a kid's show. So, you know, nobody can die in a kid's show, right? So we would get these like defibrillators and, you know, rub this cream, I guess, together, right? And I think, what's going on here? And he'd go, clear, boom. And I was like, Doo they come back to life. And I would be like, yes. And everybody would be happy. Dixie would be hugging Dr. Brackett. Yeah, with that weird hat, that old nurse hat. And it would just be, everyone would celebrate. 
It was exciting. It was that spark. It was that energy that brought him back to life. Let us look for that inspiration. Let us be on the lookout for God at work and find that spark this Christmas and into the new year. And let's have a revival. Let's preach the love of God in our communities, through our actions, and through our care of others, so that people will know the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen?